Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Graben with York County Audubon. And on behalf of our board of directors, delighted to have you with us here tonight for our May program. Uh, quite a month it is. Birds and warblers are pouring in. So a great time for this program. First, a word about our program for next month. Next month, we will be presenting a special musical event entitled Bird Songs. Monica Graben, who has been a performer and singer for many, many years, uh, a number of years ago did a program for us entitled Bird Songs, and not referring to the types of bird songs that Doug's going to be talking about tonight, but rather bird songs uh, taking typically traditional folk songs and popular tunes and re lyricizing them, adding new lyrics to uh, make them songs about birding or more relevant to today's birding and birders. And that show uh, several years back was tremendously well received. And we're delightful, we're delighted to next month have a an updated version of that uh, at our, it'll be on Tuesday, June 21st. And I will note that one of the people who was most taken and in love with that program that Monica did uh, was Pat Moynihan, who was our longtime uh, member of our board of directors and a wonderful birder and wonderful person. And she passed away this past December. So this uh, program that will be coming up next month will be, of course, for your entertainment and enjoyment, but it will also be in part a uh, in memory in Pat's memory and in honor of Pat, uh, as we uh, miss her very much. Uh, and one technical note on that program, while audio is not typically a concern when you're watching a Zoom uh, in which a speaker is speaking, uh, it may be more of a concern or uh, more of a desire, desire for quality audio when you're watching a musical performance. So we encourage you to uh, try that with headphones or external speakers if you can. Uh, you'll certainly be able to hear it without those, but if you can do that, it will add to the quality of the experience. And one quick traditional note for tonight, uh, that's more, we say it almost every month, but it's more critical this month probably than any other. That is, please keep cats indoors. Cats kill millions of birds. Uh, your cats, if you have neighbors or friends with cats, please encourage them, especially when birds are migrating in, are exhausted, are then engaging in mating and nesting. Uh, enough said, they're particularly vulnerable. Uh, but, on to tonight. Uh, we are delighted to have with us uh, Mr. Can I call you Mr.? Mr. Doug Hitchcox. Doug is a longtime member of the York County Audubon Board of Directors. He's also the staff naturalist at Maine Audubon for many a year. Uh, he's known uh, to birders throughout the state he's, he, and beyond. He's active in all things bird related uh, in the state of Maine. And we're thrilled to have him here tonight for this program entitled, What's That Bird I Hear? Uh, which is a question that many of us ask ourselves many times a day, especially at this time of year. So Doug's gonna give us some tips and suggestions for how to better answer that question with a greater regularity than we otherwise might. So we will have a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat at any time and we'll get you some answers at the end of the program. Uh, but with that and without further ado, here's Doug. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I have a lot to cover. Uh, let's see, share. There will be audio. I'm gonna make sure that you can hear that as best you can. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna make sure I have my chat window open because I'm gonna have a little quiz for you guys um, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but I'm gonna quiz you on some songs. Um, but we'll get there, as said. Uh, so yeah, tonight's program is this, uh, what's that bird I'm hearing as, as we're calling it, but um, it's kind of a, a version of, uh, for a, a series I do at Maine Audubon that we call our, our Birding Basics series. This one is, uh, also goes by the alternative title, Birding by Ear. So um, I guess I'll show you an outline in a second, but I, I'm almost contractually obligated to start with this one. Certainly since you found this program, I assume that you're well aware with Maine Audubon, um, York County obviously being a chapter of Maine Audubon, but I just wanna make the plug that uh, we're doing a ton of work. Uh, I'll mention some bird walks, uh, some other uh, programs and things that we're doing right now. We're trying to do a lot more of it for free uh, to be as accessible as possible, uh, especially virtually where we can have, you know, hundreds of people attending programs from large geographic areas. Um, but the only way we can do that work uh, because we are a member-based organization is either by you becoming a member uh, or donating. So keep that in mind. Um, there's a lot of great work that Maine Audubon's doing through our education department where I work our conservation department, as you can see here, like middle of the screen, Laura Zitsky out on beaches. I know especially York County hosts uh, the majority of Maine's sandy beaches and thus all of our nesting piping plovers uh, or all of them that nest on those beaches. Uh, and then um, we, we've got our, our third leg, we stand on the, the action or advocacy. So got a lot of work going on right now. Uh, and we need your support to, to keep doing it. Just to get on your radar, uh, in case you're not aware, these are mostly all listed on Maine Audubon's website. The Fort Williams Walk might not be yet, um, but I'm leading a ton of <laughs> bird walks this time of year. Uh, I'll be at Evergreen Cemetery tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, Evergreen Cemetery in Portland. Uh, it's a wonderful migrant trap. Um, haven't been there the last couple days as intended, but a huge thanks to some of my colleagues, uh, Nick Lund and Linda Woodard, who filled in for me. Um, but I'll be back tomorrow, uh, Thursday and Friday as well. Next Monday, we're at Fort Williams. We do that walk every year, and it's an uh, absolutely wonderful place to see birds, often coming right in off the ocean as they're migrating in the morning. Uh, and then River Point Conservation Area Biodiversity Research Institute is doing bird banding there. So you can join us uh, and actually get to see those birds in the hand, which is really cool. They have mist nets set up. We'll get all into that. <clears throat> and these are all at 7 a.m. I see folks in the chat. Um, it's a nice thing. Every single morning, we start at 7 a.m. Uh, again, these should all be up on mainaudubon.org uh, if you wanna find more information, links on where to go and everything. Every Thursday, I do a bird walk at Gilson Farm, uh, Maine Audubon's headquarters in Falmouth, except this Thursday, I'll be at Evergreen. And then I just want to make a plug. We've got an evening puffin cruise at a new harbor on May 31st. Not for free. Uh, we do need to pay for the boat. Um, but that's a bit earlier than we tend to do them in the year. And it'll also be a little earlier in the evening. So um, there's still plenty of space on that trip. Uh, it's it's going to be a fun one uh, for sure. <clears throat> so what I want to cover tonight, I've, I've really changed this talk uh, every year or certainly every time I, I do this presentation. Um, it makes no sense for me to just uh, sit here and, you know, say, play a house sparrow song and say this is what it sounds like. And um, you'll learn birdsong with, with repetition. That is certainly one of the best ways to do it. But what I always try to do in, in 
these programs or like any of my birding basics ones is, is try to teach more um, the things that I think are like harder to pick up from either like a book or a CD or, or something else. So we're gonna cover things like very basic biology. I like to quickly admit like <clears throat> I was a finance major when I was in school. Uh, I got permission to eat in biology. Uh, and it was very funny to fail the first quiz because I knew the birds biology, but I didn't know, understand mammals that well. And so the questions were, um, it was about the circulatory system comparing birds uh, to mammals. And I could explain the birds, but who knows what's happening in, in mammals. So we'll briefly touch on it. Um, talk about why birds sing and then get into this idea of like, what is the difference between a song, a call? Uh, there's lots of vocalizations that, that birds can make. And then as we're going through, we'll talk about things like dialects, how birds learn their songs. Um, I usually say that we'll wrap up with common examples, uh, but I doubt we'll get there. What I wanna wrap up with are some resources. Uh, I'm sure folks are probably aware of some of the cool apps that are out there. Merlin being uh, an absolutely amazing tool. <clears throat> it has its shortcomings, and we can talk about some of those when we get there. Uh, I'll wrap up with some of those books and uh, CDs, those apps, um, the things that can then be essentially your homework assignments uh, to go from here. So uh, I do like to point out, you know, there's this wonderful hobby that we all do um, called bird watching. But since we're going to be talking about birding by ear so much, um, this is where I think you're kind of taking your skill from the idea of like bird watching, which to me is like you looking out your backyard window, maybe at your bird feeder, and just watching the birds that are there. To me, the hobby, the 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 sport, if you will, of birding is when you're actually going out, pursuing birds, trying to you know find them out in the field, uh, and that's birding to me. So no longer are we bird watching. Uh, I do like to point out, we've got these birders over here, birding. Then you've got, this has photos from uh, Cornell, who's there. Uh, and I apologize, that is unstable. So I hope you can hear me fine. I'll keep going and we'll cross our fingers for the best. Um, this was an audio recording workshop I did uh, through the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab. Um, and so here was this tour, these people that were going around um, touring the campus. Uh, they were spotting, there's a clay colored sparrow sitting up in the tree that we were trying to record. So here were the birders, here were the bird watchers. And then I loved this guy in the background, the birder watcher. Um, he was, watching the birders, um, pretty entertaining. So let's talk about the biology uh, for a second. The, um, uh, the, the organ that birds use to produce their vocalizations, that is the songs and the calls, uh, is very different, uh, not only in its structure, but also its kind of location in the body from, from our own. Uh, I always laugh at, diagrams like this because, um, you know, we've got this larynx sitting in our throat, uh, but we certainly don't tend to think of it looking like this. The, the important takeaway here, uh, here's the trachea. You can think of this, you know, our windpipe. Um, the larynx is sitting at the top of the trachea, uh, contains these hard membranes, those are our vocal cords, and we get this um, vibration as air passes, um, <laughs> excuse me, um, the only thing I want you to know is there's, you know, this wonderful system of complex uh, muscles and cartilage that are essentially creating um, um, this little bit of control that, that we have as uh, air is essentially vibrating um, through. The much cooler um, avian syrinx, notice, now we're going all the way down to the bottom of the trachea. So this 
steering for birds is actually sitting really low down in the chest, uh, surrounded by air, sac air sacs kind of deeper uh, into the breast cavity. Um, what's so kind of neat about these is that where we have this split going on, the way I've heard uh, uh, this explain that the tension that's on these membranes, you can think of it as like the skin on a drum being able to adjust that so you can make different noises on a drum by pulling that skin tighter or loosening up on it a little bit. And so that's how birds uh, are able to control both the intensity kind of the loudness uh, and the frequency, which is their pitch, by altering the air pressure passing from the lungs uh, to the syrinx uh, by varying that tension um, and doing it in both sides of these. So they have <clears throat> not only twice, uh, uh, what's the way to say that? Um, I'll call it twice the complexity, but it's, it's even more than that. And rather than looking at these silly diagrams, let's look at an actual bird's vocalization here. So this is gonna be for Northern Cardinal. And I'll show you a few spectrograms uh, throughout the evening. Spectrograms are showing us frequency um, measured here in uh, kilohertz, I guess. Um, hertz over time. So some of these I've created little videos out of, it'll be easier to see those um, in a minute. Uh, but what we're getting to see are these upslurred notes and then some downslurred notes. And let's listen to this bird now. Kind of easy to follow that bird along. What's fun to hear, again, remember how they can control kind of the left and right side <coughs> of that syrinx. They can make different noises out of either side. And using this diagram, if we were to draw it, color this in as this kind of blue section, we could imagine the blue being like the left side and then the red being the right side. That's how they can start adding complexity to their songs without needing like this um, kind of extra effort to change pitch. Like we could all whistle like this. You know, it's a very easy like. But like I'm literally having to change like the shape of my tongue, my lips. Um, these birds are able to control all of that right in their chest. Uh, thanks to that amazing organ that they have. Uh, Worth noting that like that's where the song, the sound is really coming from. Um, if you ever see a bird sing, obviously they don't have the lips, they're just opening their beak, um, but really very little tongue control too. So that's kind of a, a really straightforward example. Let's look at a much more complex song, the hermit thrush. Uh, we'll talk more, I guess, about some other thrushes, but uh, thrushes tend to have these very complex, uh, uh, often described as like otherworldly vocalizations that they can make. And it's not only because they're just singing with like the left or right side, they're singing with the left and right at the same time, which is really tricky. <laughs> um, let's listen to this bird, hermit thrush, <clears throat> Excuse me. Hermit thrush always has a single introductory note before going into this flute like, again, otherworldly sounding noise. Um, let's listen to it. And now, why that? You could imagine that's going to be really hard to imitate. And it's because we physically can't with our one uh, larynx, one uh, uh, windpipe, if you will. But you know what I mean. We physically cannot imitate this noise. Uh, the closest thing I think humans are really capable of, if you ever hear, um, uh, what are they called? Throat singers, I think is the, sorry if I've got that, that name wrong, but um, you, you, can, you can almost uh, do a little imitation. If you try to hum while you whistle, uh, I won't do it right now, especially with the dry throat I've got going, but 
here's a, a fun test for you later. Try to hum while you whistle. <laughs> Not my best. Here's Beery. This is another type of thrush. Um, and let's look at their song on a spectrogram as well. This one should play along with it, which is a little easier to keep track of. Maybe a little lag with the audio, but uh, what's fun to see, it's a little hard to see on, on just the coloring of the spectrogram, but this bird is again using both the left and right sides and essentially singing with itself. And that's what gives it that um, almost echoey part of the, of the song. Uh, what's really fun to do, let me play this one more time at normal speed. Now let's play it back at half speed, half of real time. Um, and I should note, the software I use to do that splits it into a two channel thing. So I, I didn't catch this when I was doing it, but that's why we'll now see there, there's two, but they should be identical. So let's listen to this at half speed and really listen for how there's this echoey nature to the song. And that's literally opposite sides of that syrinx uh, singing just slightly off, but with itself. I love that. You can really like hear, again, the, the kind of two parts. I'll play it one more time just for kicks. Uh, just to look at a few other birds real quick. Um, I, I, I really like having spectrograms. I'm a visual learner. I do not have a good musical ear, so for me to just hear birds sing and be told like, oh, here's the mnemonic for that. Like um, it, it sticks eventually, but when I can have a visualization, it, it really kind of helps me kind of break down the parts of the song. So I'll do that for a few here. Um, chestnut sided warbler, uh, as we were saying earlier, another one of these species that has really arrived this week. Um, quite a few of them showed up yesterday. Uh, let's listen to the song. A common mnemonic is please, 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 <clears throat> excuse me. Please, please, please to meet you. Play it one more time. And now let's listen to this at half speed. I like doing this because again, it, I think it helps you kind of break down the songs and, and realize some of the complexity that's going on here when you, you know, first hear <coughs> a lot of the different types of warblers. Um, a lot of them sound very similar, but when you start getting into um, truly the, the structure of some of these songs, it can really help. And here's one more complex one, Song Sparrow. One of our most abundant songsters all over the state, uh, pretty much anywhere you're gonna go over the next few months, you're likely to hear song sparrows singing. A good mnemonic for this is maids, 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 put on your tea, kettle, little, little. So a few nice you know, <laughs> introductory notes there. I apologize for the coughing and dry throat on day five of a COVID diagnosis. So feeling great. Um, we've got a few introductory notes. That's kind of the, the key thing to, to listen for. Um, and then there's these wonderful trills kind of at the middle and towards the end. Play this one more time. And now let's listen to it just because this is so fun to do. Slow it down for us.
Now there's a lot going on here. Uh, uh, the complexity of some of these notes, we even get harmonics that are, are rising up. Um, for the sake of tonight's program, uh, I'm not gonna go into that too much. I'll quickly mention, and I'll hold this up again towards the end. Uh, I assume, sorry, I never quite know how webinar works. If you, if you all can see me, I hope you can. Uh, the uh, Peterson uh, Field Guide to Field Guide to Sounds of Eastern North America by uh, Nathan uh, uh, Pipelo. Sorry, I think I always say his name wrong. Um, has a wonderful breakdown of essentially how to read spectrograms. Um, a lot of it's uh, available online too. So uh, Nathan's got this kind of wonderful resource, especially if, if you are really into spectrograms. Um, Hmm. And I apologize if, uh, if folks are <clears throat> having trouble with that audio. Let's see how it uh, keeps working throughout. So why do birds sing? And we need to be very clear about what the definition of uh, song is. And a song is any noise that a bird is uh, is creating that is used to either attract a mate or defend a territory. And so why I'm kind of emphasizing, it's, it's those two things. What they're doing is either attracting a mate or defending a territory. And then it's any noise that's created to do that. So that can be a vocalization, what we all probably think of when we think of a bird's song. Uh, but it's fun to know that there are a number of other things that birds do, they can be mechanical noises that are also considered bird song. So this time of year, very easy to hear woodpeckers drumming and truly like drumming, like I'm not good at tapping on my desk, I guess, but um, when you hear that loud, like hollowed out tree, that rapid drum, not just pecking away at the wood as you know, they would be looking for food, but um, that really loud drumming. Drumming, again, it's a, it's a mechanical noise. It's from the woodpecker hammering its beak against a, a generally hollow substrate. Um, that is considered that bird's song. Uh, another fun one is um, ruffed grouse this time of year are drumming, uh, where they're essentially clapping their wings against their body in that deep, very low uh, drumming or booming noise. Um, again, not a vocalization at all, but that is still considered their song. Um, so that's your, your fun, I guess, fun fact of, of the night maybe, that um, we define a song by its purpose to uh, attract mate or defend territory. Some singing might be done for a bit of communication. I'll talk about uh, females singing in just a little bit. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But then I would say important to know that just about any other noise uh, that we hear birds making, otherwise it's, it's essentially considered call. Um, that's gonna be kind of a good way for you to, to separate things from, you'll hear birders talk about songs and calls. And that generally is kind of our two categories. Um, chips, uh, chip notes are arguably call notes, but um, uh, I think a key thing before maybe we move on from this is just, um, you know, if that purpose is to attract a mate or defend a territory, I always think of it like this magnolia warbler here singing its heart out. When you hear birds singing first thing in the morning, it's as if they're like stepping out on their front doors, you know, front door of their, their territory and just yelling at their neighbors. Um, you stay over there, I'll stay over here. Like that's your territory. You know, birds are typically trying to not be very um, confrontational. You rarely, rarely see birds uh, in physical fights. There's certainly some, some aggressive ones out there. Hummingbirds are super aggressive. Um, excuse me, <laughs> but um, 
that tends to be kind of the, the reason why. The, the key thing, females are also listening to these songs, these complex songs that birds are putting together to, um, to attract those mates. And they can usually hear it in a much better or, or finer detail than we can. So that's another reason why I like to play those songs back to you slowed down is that's probably like how well the female bird can hear that song. And she's gonna start picking through like, you know, if we could imagine, sorry, if I can go back for a second. If we take our song sparrow here, you know, looks like a great song, but like notice a little bit of a bigger gap between like these first two notes than here and here. Like if you're a picky female song sparrow who, <coughs> excuse me, only wants the best mate, you know, maybe that's just not cutting it. He's a little too short for you or <laughs> whatever the comparison might be, but um, they can, uh, uh, they're listening to these, these songs on a much higher quality um, uh, or higher definition, if you will, than, um, than we can. So I started mentioning calls. These are typically just used for communication. Um, uh, you'll often hear calls used when predators are around. So a nice thing about calls versus songs is that they tend to be very short and very high pitched. So songs can be longer, they can be complex, uh, sometimes lower pitch uh, because um, you're trying to convey a lot of information um, and, and maybe not uh, super far. Where a call, if there's a predator, if there's a hawk that comes by, you wanna give a short high pitched call because uh, being high pitched, it's not gonna travel very far, but it's really hard to pinpoint. If you ever hear you know, a really high pitched noise, especially a bird, <coughs> excuse me, it can be often really hard to pick out exactly where in a tree they are because it's just, it's again, hard to pinpoint high frequency noises. Low frequency, like that drumming uh, grouse, you can turn right to where they're coming from, you know, in the woods and that'll travel really far distances. So calls are wonderful to, to not give yourself away. Uh, we know they're also used as uh, air traffic control, essentially. So um, <coughs> excuse me, there's hundreds of thousands of birds that are migrating overhead each night right now. Sometimes we're getting millions of birds passing over and it's really fun to go out. So sorry. <clears throat> and it's fun to go out at night, usually about an hour after sunset, it'll continue. Um, Sometimes up until midnight, uh, birds are often going to be flying even later than that, but they're going to be so high up, that they can be harder to detect. But you'll hear them giving these call notes. <clears throat> Let me try playing a few for you right now. So that little, there's a warbler. Here's a sparrow, a little higher and thinner. A little background noise here, but you get that loud ping, ping. The rose-breasted grosbeak. It is a great call to learn. Grosbeaks call sometimes a lot more than they sing. And so what's really fun is uh, people have put together what they call the Rosetta Stone uh, to warblers. <laughs> and so a little hard to see on, especially if you're on a small screen, but each one of these is showing the, uh, the, the image that would show up on a spectrogram. If you were to record these warblers as they're calling at night, uh, here's 48 species of our North American wood warblers um, and all the different noises they make. So there's um, there's research that's now being done. Uh, this will be accessible, I think, to almost anyone in your, your backyard, probably in the next couple of years, where you can just essentially leave a microphone pointed 
up to the sky overnight, record what passes and essentially get a readout of uh, what birds and, and with what uh, frequency they were uh, detected each night. So pretty amazing stuff. <coughs> Louisiana water thrush, one of our warblers. <clears throat> uh, I wanted this to be a segue into uh, just discuss like um, how do birds learn their songs? We know a, a lot of them do. I guess that's the, the spoiler. Vocal learning is a very kind of rare thing um, amongst animals, especially rare in, in, in mammals. Um, so far, it's only been dem demonstrated in one uh, primate, humans, we're doing a good job at it. Cetacean, so like whales and dolphins uh, have vocal learning. Uh, there's two species of bats, and that's about it for mammals, which is like not very many, which is amazing when you contrast it to birds. There's 10,000 species of birds in the world. <coughs> excuse me, of those 10,000, almost 5,000 of them are uh, uh, ex ex exhibit vocal learning. They learn their songs and calls. Um, that's gonna be this group, we'll, we'll talk about the ossine passerines or ossine songbirds. Um, that also includes our, our parrots, which there's about 350 species of, and then hummingbirds also have learned songs. <coughs> Hummingbirds around the world have, or excuse me, it's just a new world species, but outside of Maine, I should say, um, can have some really complex, uh, quite amazing songs that uh, that they give. We, we typically don't get to enjoy it as much with our ruby-throated hummingbird here, but, uh, but cool to know. So let's break down how do birds learn their songs. Um, as juveniles, typically, and, and we'll kind of generalize for a second here and, and then talk about some of the birds in, in these different categories. Typically, they're learning when they're young, uh, much in the same way that, that humans have this kind of uh, <clears throat> this learning period. For birds, it occurs in two stages. The uh, sensory learning, which is basically when you are a juvenile bird, uh, typically still sitting in a nest. So as a little baby bird, you're sitting in a nest and you're going to be listening to kind of the environment around you. Guess who's gonna be probably the most uh, uh, abundant or loudest singing bird nearby? Most likely going to be your father. So, or hopefully some, some other similar, um, of the same species, I should say. So you're going to, you know, have this example that you're going to listen to, and you're going to be memorizing uh, the spectral. So that's the frequency and the temporal and time. Spectral <clears throat> and temporal qualities of the song, and that gives you this template, uh, literally just called a song template that birds are going to essentially now keep with them for the rest of their lives. So that's happening. If we just look at like our this top diagram here, um, after hatching, you're having this sensory period when you're you know sitting in the nest, listening to your father. And this is where things like dialects start coming in. So if you're listening to your father or some of the neighboring birds, you might notice um, the twang in their voice or that southern drawl that they have. And that's where this bird is going to learn that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's essentially going to be added to their uh, song template. <clears throat> and now they've got that template. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're hopefully going to survive the fall and the winter. Some birds, you'll actually start hearing them singing even later in the fall. Uh, there's some sparrows that are really good examples of this, like white-throated sparrows you'll hear singing in the fall. But especially going into the spring, this is where they're in the second period that we call the sensory motor period. 
And this is when they're going to start producing their own vocalizations and practicing. And they're basically trying to make their voice match that song template that they've learned. So learning it here in that sensory period, now they're singing themselves, trying to match it, hopefully by spring when they're attracting a mate. And then that song becomes what we call crystallized. Back here, plastic is the term, a plastic song that's going to change a lot. Once they've hit it, they've matched that template. They say, this is how my song should sound. Um, that is going to be crystallized in their memory and they can now sing that song uh, essentially for the rest of their lives. Sorry, I think I actually have another, yeah, I like this diagram a little better. Um, plus it's got nice pictures of birds on it. <coughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So just uh, uh, a couple birds to look at um, real quick. Things like our, our zebra finches are one of the most studied songbirds out there, um, which have this uh, uh, very short period where they're essentially crystallizing that one song that they'll have. Um, white crowned, or here in Maine, you can think of white throated sparrows having this kind of awesome uh, uh, thing that they do. So having that sensory period we talked about, practicing that sub song, again, as we call it the plastic song going throughout the uh, winter. Now they're gonna sound great, uh, but each year they have to essentially keep learning that song. And so what you'll hear, uh, white-throated sparrow has the mnemonic that a lot of people use is like old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. So you get these introductory notes, it's like, <clears throat> sorry, can't whistle too well right now, but. And so like that would be a nice crystallized song for, for one of these birds. But what you'll hear, especially in the fall, when they have this plastic song, is you'll hear. And then they just stop. And it's again them like referring to that template, testing it out, trying to figure it out again. Um, until they, they crystallize it. And it's worth noting there is this other group, what we call the, the open-ended learners. Um, that's funny, I thought, let's just look back here. This is actually the right way to look at it. They have multiple sensory periods. Um, so they're learning throughout one part of the year, then they, <laughs> excuse me, singing and practicing themselves. Then they'll pick up more songs. So these are things like, uh, this is a canary in the photo here, but for folks who know the different mimics, so things like a mockingbird, a gray catbird, brown thrasher, birds that are imitating other noises that they hear, they're going to keep adding to their repertoire uh, each year during that sensory period that they keep having. Here's a fun one. Here's a one of our open-ended learners. This is a European starling. Uh, this video, um, I took it off of uh, YouTube. Jay Lumi, I guess was this guy's name, who uploaded this uh, kind of amazing video of his, um, it's a pet European starling as a non-native species. Uh, it can be kept as pets in the US. Um, and his starling has heard him talking so much that it's actually started to learn some of the things that he says. So let me click play. I like to play violin music. Here's a station. Stop it for a second. It's a little hard to hear. He's saying, hey, Alexa, play violin music. I like to play violin music. Here's a station. I like to play violin music. Here's a station. Here's a station. I got a kid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Alexa. Stop. Alexa. Stop. So 
so there's definitely something comical to it that like the bird has learned it saying alexa stop uh, <laughs> which probably the most common thing you say to your little listening devices um what's also fun in that video is you can see how much like it doesn't need to open its beak to make those vocalizations but you can see those feathers uh down in the throat that are are moving so much um just absolutely fascinating there, there's so many cool um not quite endless, but there's plenty of videos of, of starlings um, imitating either people, uh, uh, <laughs> all sorts of things that they hear, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it's worth also mentioning, so we've talked about these uh, open-ended learners, these, these birds that are that have vocal learning. Um, but as I as we said kind of at the beginning, that's only about half of all the birds out there, especially the, the fossine passerines. <clears throat> but there's a number of these other birds like Phoebe here, um, especially flycatchers, I think are one of the best examples of it because they're still a very vocal bird. They have these uh, amazing songs, but they are innate learners. They are born knowing their one song um, and that's what they're gonna sound like. <clears throat> and from a birder's perspective, that's actually one of like the best <laughs> things for us because there's they're not going to be that confusing at all. Every single Eastern Phoebe you hear is probably going to sound like every other Eastern Phoebe you hear. Same thing, uh, pretty much all of our flycatchers. Uh, just worth noting, you know, said it a couple times, but uh, female birds do have uh, quite interesting. Uh, repertoire of songs. Um, you don't have to go too far back in literature to find where a lot of people said like females don't sing and it's just the males that are defending their territories but uh, there's a number of of, uh, of those birds out there. It's actually 71% of all the uh, of all these pastorings that at least have some female song present uh, so it's a lot more abundant than than we really thought. Uh, I've used this word a couple times. You see it a lot only when you're reading about bird vocalizations. I feel like uh, otherwise uh, you never quite hear the breakup of our, our passerines. Passerines are our songbirds. And there's these, the ossine passerines and the sub ossine passerines. And one of the things that really kind of separates them is how complex uh, their syrinx is. And what I wanted to show kind of in this slide is let's take a Virginia rail. This is not a passerine at all. It's not a songbird, it's a rail. Um, and arguably a, a kind of older lineage, if you will. Um, they do have an amazing vocalization, but I'll play it in a second and you'll hear it. It's not super complex. <laughs> Kind of one one note, except for that last one, that's like really a, a burst of it. Let's go into a sub ossine passerine. So a songbird, you know, should have this really elaborate song, right? Kingbirds, they do have a slightly more complex down song that they'll do. Excuse me. <clears throat> But this is generally what they are going to sound like. Now, once we step into this, uh, they actually evolved later. That's kind of the key thing with these ossine passerines that have these really complex songs it's because they're built for it. So let's listen to White Eyed Vireo. That <laughs> Clearly a complex, really cool song. Uh, Oh, and this is a fun one. Sorry, it's a it's a bad video. This is me holding my phone through my spotting scope. But just to show, here's a female northern cardinal. It's really hard to hear, but you can even see it in the video. So the male is singing back. Here's a male and female singing. So it's a fun one to look for when you can have sexually dimorphic birds. That's where the males and females look different. Um, and especially with cardinals. Now, this is a really fun time of year. If you hear a cardinal singing, track it down and see 
Is it a female that's singing? Um, for the sake of time, I'll kind of skip this story. Uh, I can't believe we're closing in on eight already. <clears throat> um, what I just wanted to show, this was a, a female, <coughs> excuse me, American Red Start that we found um, that was singing. And what's neat is that with each one of the, her songs, it's the most, it's the kind of loudest or, 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 or um, showing up the best on the on these speckerams here is uh, it's very plastic. Notice how every time she sang, it looks a little different. Some of these are kind of similar, but every time she sang, it was a, it was a little bit different. Um, the male that was in the territory, you can see his part of the spectrogram here. Um, every time he sang, it was spot on. It sounded exactly the same as this crystallized song. And what was cool watching this nest was the female would sing a little bit, maybe wait a minute, sing again. And then as time went on, she would start singing faster and faster to almost this like constant song. And then the male would come zipping in with a mouthful of food. And the female would occasionally feed. And after the male left, the female would have this kind of slow song again, singing every minute or so. And then same thing, like we, we watch this happen over the course of half an hour where <clears throat> her song intensity would pick up just as it was getting kind of at its loudest or, or most frequent, the male would come zipping in with food and off he'd go. Um, so clearly there's some sort of communication that was going on there with this female bird song. So the only takeaway is that like we're, we're, we're still kind of looking at the tip of the iceberg, I think, as we're um, trying to learn uh, what is the purpose of female song. So let's do um, <coughs> some of the fun part of learning bird song. Um, we're clearly going to go over eight o'clock. I apologize if folks are uh, looking for that hard stop at eight, but let's do this as quickly as we can. Here's some of my tips for learning bird song and why I think it's so important. One of the rarest birds I've seen in North America, this was the stunning view that I got of it. There it is. You can kind of see this nice rounded head. There's the belly. There's a Key West quail dove. Um, <coughs> despite the name, they're not in Key West. Um, they're probably all hunted out of there. But we only were able to find this bird because of some of the noises that it was making. There's other birds right in our backyards here. This is Kennebunk Plains. Go there this time of year. And you'll find things like Eastern Whippoorwills. Uh, Whippoorwills are, uh, I think I've seen one once. Otherwise, uh, you really only hear them. And there's a Chuck Wills widow that's up in Orland, Maine. Back, I think, four years now. <laughs> There's also some birds that you just visibly can't identify. We were talking about flycatchers earlier. This is one of the, another one of those with an innate song. Uh, and the, the group of flycatchers that birders kind of hate, the Impidinax flycatchers, they all look very similar. And many of them, uh, or I should say, there's a few of them that you really cannot identify unless you hear the bird vocalize. So alder flycatcher and willow flycatcher, we could have one of each in either hand side by side, and unless one made a noise, we could not tell you uh, which one is which. <coughs> So real quick, I'm going to play the choice. Free beer. Free beer. Now the willow flycatcher. It's you. You get a different emphasis in the song, kind of at different times, but um, uh, we mentioned Pat Moynihan earlier. This was a hummingbird that showed up at her house back in 2012. Um, and we actually identified it first, uh, just using a, a recording of uh, its, its vocalization, which was really cool. Uh, a fun thing I, I just wanted to mention, I found this email, 2008, the first Christmas bird count 
I helped out with. <coughs> Lita Beth, the compiler, sent out this email and asked for uh, birders that were able to identify uh, golden crown kinglets and brown creepers by ear. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost Doug. Doug? I think we're still live on the Zoom. Um, and I'm speaking to you if you want to continue through my phone. Yeah, Doug's saying, please bear with him for a moment. He's trying to figure out why his video froze. Yeah, Doug, Doug's trying to re-engage his internet. Well, do you want to, should we leave it at that? Yeah. I think, I think we'll need to uh, wrap up this program. We did get almost all the way through it. We can post a uh, 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 an epilogue to it, if that might be helpful. Yeah, I wonder if I can do uh, just a recording or something. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say. Uh, share my apologies with everyone. I will. So Doug extends his apologies to everyone. And we will do, he will record a little epilogue to uh, complete the program. And we'll post that on our website, along with the recording of the program that we did get through. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Uh, please take a, keep an eye out for that on our website uh, or YouTube page. And uh, we hope to see you next month. And uh, Doug, thanks very much for doing your best to get through the program tonight. And we ha you have our best wishes for completing your recovery. And uh, go easy on your vo voice for a few more days is, uh, I think, our 
uh, recommendation. Okay. No, no problem whatsoever. So thank you, everyone, and good night.